1 Samuel 18. Good? Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So uh, I've been going through uh, the last week. I did a lesson on the hidden details in the life of David, just going through some of the things here in the Bible. And uh, last week we looked at uh, David's lineage and uh, his brothers, how David is the seventh and the eighth. Um, I was talking to Brother Rowley about that, and I think we've found the other three Shepherds, which I'm excited about. One of these days, I'll do a full, maybe a full lesson on that. The seven and seven shepherds and eight principal men. It's okay if it's streaming. That's fine. Yeah, we'll just leave it th with that for now. All right, and uh, thank you. And then uh, the other. Th so we looked at David's lineage with his brothers. How David is a seventh and an eighth child, which is a weird thing. But if you're wondering how that works, look at the go watch the previous. Uh, episode, <laughs> the previous sermon. And then uh, David's age when he was anointed uh, was roughly around 15 years old. And when he fought Goliath around 16 or around 16 at that age, probably right around that time period, he couldn't have been any older than 16 based on the evidence that we find in the scriptures and some of the hidden details that we find in the text. And so we saw last week in Proverbs chapter two, God invites his people to study his word. There's nothing wrong with that. And even uh, though we're delving into some uncertainties, uh, we can be confident that a study like this is not a waste of time. God wants us to look at the details. He said every word of God is pure, right? Every word means every word, not just the ideas or the principles beneath the text. Every single word. When the Bible uses the word, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of these old archaic words and people say, well, we need to change these words. And it says, whist. What does whist mean? Nobody says whist anymore. Well, every word of God is pure. And so we leave it alone and it's uh, God's word and he inspired everyone. And so we just believe it all. And so we look at the details of these things. That's what I'm pointing out is God has details in the, in the Bible. And if you look at every word, you find some amazing things. All right. Now I pointed out last week that David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned seven and a half years in Jerusalem when he became king of Judah. He reigned for seven and a half years and then he reigned 33 years over all of Israel, which means that he lived to be 70 and a half years old, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Make sure everybody's on board. All right. He lived to be 70 and a half years old, or if we were just round it to 70 years old, and he died. Okay. And remember, a lot of things happened over the course of that 70 years of David's life, but God only chose to record a certain select events. And the fact that God recorded some events in David's life and not others in, its, in and of itself tells you that there are significance to the stories that we're reading. These aren't just a hodgepodge selection of different things that David did. God included certain stories, and there's a reason why he did that. And we know that throughout Scripture, David in particular is a great type of Jesus Christ, right? In Psalms 22, there's, David describes some things that, uh, you know, they have pierced my hands and my feet. And it's prophetic of Jesus Christ, but he's describing it of something that happened to himself. Okay, so we have that type of Christ there. David's reign is a type of the reign of Jesus Christ, or a picture of that. In Psalms chapter 2, he uh, talks about that, and how, uh, the, how his enemies would be subdued under his feet and all that. All right, so we know that there's a prophetic significance to the recorded events of David's life, and I'm going to look at a few more of those this morning. And the events of David's life that God chose to record in the Scriptures, if you'll remember, uh, generally speaking, are, number one, David is anointed by Samuel. Uh, number two, David kills Goliath. Number three, uh, David flees from Saul in the wilderness. Now, these aren't just super consecutive one right after the other. This month, this year, this year, this year, this year. Sometimes there's some time gaps in there. But these are the stories that the Bible records. So uh, David is in exile. He goes to live with the Philistines. Uh, he's made king over Judah. He's made king over Israel. And then you have the episode with Bathsheba, and then you have the episode with Absalom, and then you have the crowning and the anointing of Solomon and the death of David. So those are some of the major stories that we find in the life of David. And this morning I want to take you into the 
fleeing into the wilderness that David did. And look at some of the hidden details of that whole story. And you'll remember from last week that David killed Goliath in one of the biggest upsets, as they say in sports, <laughs> in history. Okay, David couldn't have been any older than 16, like I pointed out when that happened. But since he's now killed a lion, and he's now killed a bear, and he's now killed a giant, Saul goes ahead and evidently makes him uh, king, or I'm not king, I'm sorry, Saul makes an exception and makes him commander of the military. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. And verse 5, because you, and I want to point this out, because you'll remember that David was sent home when the Philistines came to attack. And we found out the reason for that was because he was not yet 20 years old. And, to, and technically, in the law, to be a part of the military, you had to be 20 years old. But after David kills Goliath, look what Saul does. Look at verse 5. Okay? So you have uh, Jonathan strips himself of his robes, gives it to David, and this is right after he's called Goliath, verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war. Now that's interesting. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So here you have this young teenager... Unless there's some time gap here, which is possible, but David or Saul is setting David over the men of war. He's a military commander, and he's not even 20 years old. He's not even supposed to be in the military, according to the law. But Saul has put him in the military. He's over the military. And uh, it seems that Saul is notorious for making exceptions. Making exceptions. He made an exception, right, when he offered the burnt sacrifice, and it seemed like Samuel was taking too long. Say, well, no, I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to go and make an exception this time. Uh, he made an exception when he spared Jonathan for eating the honey, when he was technically supposed to die because of the curse that Saul had made. Now, that's another story in and of itself. That's a weird one. Uh, Saul made an exception when he spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Saul also made an exception when he went to the witch at Endor. So he's just always making exceptions. <laughs> he's always Mr. Exceptional. Watch out for thoughts that tell you that you're the exception to the rule. You say, well, I know that the Bible says such and such, but I'm the exception. You've got to watch out for that. Well, it's wrong for everybody else, but I'm the exception. No, you've got to watch out for that. Uh, David was set over the men of war, and then it says in verse 6, And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. You know, they're having this big party, you know, you think of these celebrations and the parade coming downtown, all the music blaring, and everybody's dancing and happy. That's kind of what was going on. And uh, verse 7, And the women answered one to another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands. You can imagine all these women on the one side of the street, Saul has slain his thousands. And on the other side of the street, they're, they're saying, and David is ten thousands. You know, and they're just doing that back and forth, back and forth. You know, like they do at sports games, you know, uh, how they, they do those cheers. That's kind of what's going on here. And it says in verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, uh, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? So Saul is basically saying that David has everything, including the people. He's got the hearts of the people. And the only thing that David doesn't have right now is the crown. And this is supposed to starting to bother Saul. And Saul's beginning to feel like he's king in name only. The people love David. They don't love me. They just listen to me because they have to. You know, and so he's getting all weird. And it says a spirit, you know, well, it doesn't say this, but I can imagine a spirit starts whispering in Saul's ear because this is how these ty type of types of things go. A, a spirit, you remember that he was uh, going to be troubled by an evil spirit. He already was. That's, David had already been playing music for him in the past. And so this spirit maybe starts whispering to Saul and says things like, you know, that David. He wants to take your throne, Saul. You know, David, he wants to take credit for everything you've done. Uh, Saul, David is trying to usurp your authority. Uh, Saul, David wants to overthrow you. Even though there's zero evidence for any of this, uh, nevertheless, when people start believing those thoughts, guess what they do? They, their solution is to strike before they're struck. Okay? Okay. So they have this idea, David's trying to take me down. I'm going to take him down before he takes me down. 
None of that thinking is from the Holy Ghost. That's, that's from the devil. It says in verse 9, And Saul eyed David from that day forward. We would say, I've got my eye on you. Right? David's done absolutely nothing wrong. David has zero ambitions of stealing the kingdom from Saul, right? Absolutely. So the question that I want to bring up uh, for this part of the story is, who has the problem here? Is it David or Saul? Or both? The answer is Saul. You say, yeah, but Saul's king, so how can he be wrong? I mean, come on, Saul's the man that God put in authority. How could he be wrong, right? Well, he can be wrong because he's a man. He's not a demigod. And Saul has sinned. <laughs> That's why he's wrong. Uh, he's sinned back with Samuel. God's already told Saul he's going to rent the, the kingdom out from under him. Saul's the one that's got the problem. David's not a troublemaker. Saul's the one who creates the problem and then da blames David for being the troublemaker. <laughs> right? Now notice that Saul is very insecure. And the reason he is insecure is because he has sinned and he knows that he's in trouble with God. That old saying is, conscience makes cowards of us all, right? The reason why people get fearful and are become cowardly is because deep down they know there might be a problem between them and God. And so they start taking it out on other people. And years prior, God was told by God to kill Agag, king of the Amalekites, but instead Saul spared him. And because of that, Samuel told Saul, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king over Israel. All right, so Saul's insecurity is because of his own sin. He has a sneaking suspicion that God is going to replace him, and he now sees who the replacement is, you see. He's already been told what's going to happen, and now he's figuring David's probably that guy. Uh, now, uh, is it David? Let me ask you this. Uh, when, when God replaces uh, Saul with David, let me just point out that when that happens, he's going to lose his kingdom, right? He's going to lose all his wealth, right? He's going to lose his reputation. He's going to lose everything. And because of this, Saul perceives that David is his enemy. But let me ask you this. Is it David who is going to take the kingdom from Saul? Or is it God who is going to take the kingdom from Saul? So then when Saul, in preemptive retaliation, attacks David... Is Saul really fighting David? Or is Saul fighting God? Is, is Saul attacking David? Or is Saul attacking God in a way? Truthfully, Saul is attacking God. And this is how those things go. The saying is, you know, don't kill the messenger, right? And if you kill the messenger, you've symbolically demonstrated your hatred and intentions for the sender, right? Okay, the messenger didn't do anything, but when you kill the messenger, you're demonstrating your hatred and intentions for the sender. All right? The same goes for the world when they kill Christians. Jesus said in John 7, 7, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, right? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And so when the world beats or imprisons or kills a Christian simply for preaching the gospel, the Christian didn't think up the gospel. God thought up the gospel. And so when the world attacks those people, they are symbolically attacking Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ regards it as such. And that's what burning effigies is all about. Uh, maybe you didn't realize that, but an effigy is basically, let's say, a, a stuffed animal, a stuffed uh, person, you know, like they build a man out of cardboard and then they light it on fire. Like you've probably seen that with people doing that to Donald Trump. You know, the effigy represents the person they hate. And by destroying the effigy, they are stating their desire to kill the person if they could. That is what that is. And the same goes with the burning of the American flag. I don't believe that uh, that should be protected under the freedom of speech. Because that's an outward demonstration of what your intentions are to do to this country. You want to destroy it. You are stating publicly, I want to burn this country down. Well, you're not much of an American citizen. Why don't you go to Russia or go to China? You might like it better over there. If you like communism so much, go to China. Go to North Korea. Amen. You know, Amen. enjoy those concentration camps and feeding on mouse droppings. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you'll love it over there. Saul has no reason to hate David. David hasn't done anything to Saul, has he? He hasn't done anything. Saul's hatred of David is a subtle indicator of Saul's true hatred for God. 
Saul would never ex- express it like that. He would never say it that way, but that's exactly what it is. Because 1 Thessalonians 4, 8 says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, in the context, your brother in Christ, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. You see. The story of David goes on, and things start getting worse and worse between David and Saul. And again, the problem is not with David. There's a major contention between these two, but you need to understand that the problem is one-sided. Now, let me say a few things about uh, conflict and conflict resolution true conflict resolution in the Bible. Now, it's been said that in every argument, there's, well, there's my, uh, his side, her side, and the truth. I've pointed this out before, but I think it bears repeating, because that's a maxim that gets quoted so often that you think it's Scripture. Kind of like the phrase, uh, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. Find that Bible verse in the Bible. Some people really think that's a Bible verse, you know. It's not. I'm just, uh, you know, educating the crowd uh, watching today. That's actually not in the Bible, <laughs> you know. But uh, sometimes people think this my side, his side, and the truth is, is a biblical maxim, and it's not. Because what you're saying is you're saying that neither person is right, both people are wrong, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Okay, You're not allowing for one person to be right and one person to be wrong, because sometimes that's the case. Sometimes that's the case. Um, that sounds nice, and it sounds fair. Well, we're just being fair. We're just saying you're both wrong. But that's not just judgment. Just judgment listens and determines who is right and who is wrong. Right? If a guy breaks into someone's house and kills a man's wife, and the man stands before the judge wanting justice, and the judge said, well, you know, there's your side, and there's his side, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to try to find a solution that will work for both of you. <laughs> you, you say that's ridiculous. It is. It's wrong, uh, you know, if the judge said, well, you know, you probably bear some responsibility, too. You know, yeah, he broke into your house at one in the morning and shot your wife while she was asleep. But you probably did something. So let's try to find out where you were wrong. That's typical Christian counseling. (laughs) It sounds stupid, but when you put it into that context, it makes sense. It's wrong to accept fault when you're right. And Job said to do so would make him a liar. He said, should I lie against my right He's saying, I haven't done anything wrong. You guys haven't been able to... If he says, if I'm wrong, show me. If I'm wrong, show me, and I'll make it right. You know, if I'm wrong, let God kill me. But he says, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm wrong when I haven't done anything wrong. If I do, I'll be a liar like you. (laughs) You know, I'm not going to sit here and lie so that we can have unity. And the mentality is, well, just tell a lie. State that you're wrong so that we can all have unity. No. How about the person who did wrong repent, (laughs) and then we can have true unity, right? I want to get this across, because everyone, uh, I want to get this across to everybody listening, because this is a big area of, not just in church, but also in society, this is a big area of mental and emotional abuse that can take place, both in the lost world, and in the body of Christ. Now, what if Saul chucks the spear at David's head, okay? And when David starts talking to Jonathan, looking for help and counsel, Jonathan says, well, you know, David, he is the king, and therefore it's unlikely that he's wrong. You must be wrong, David. Uh, Kings don't just throw spears at people for no reason. (laughs) You know, the fact that that a man in authority like Saul would throw a spear at you is proof that you must have done something wrong. David, I can tell that there's something going on between you and Saul. Why don't you just be the bigger man and apologize to Saul? Apologize for what? (laughs) Why? So he can throw another spear at my head? I mean, seriously, that's the kind of counsel that that often just goes around. Well, yeah, you didn't do anything, but just humble yourself and apologize for something you didn't do so we can all be happy again. It sounds good until you actually think about what it is you're saying. (laughs) Uh, I say that it is mental and emotional abuse because what ends up happening is most Christians who are counseled this way and who go along with this type of counsel, and I hope everybody's listening, including the people online or on uh, the YouTube or whatever, this kind of counsel, when a Christian accepts this kind of counsel and has been abused or oppressed, and has done nothing wrong, and they accept a false sense of guilt. They say, you know what, I am wrong, and I'm going to apologize. 
when they've really done nothing wrong, and they're accepting a false sense of guilt, they apologize to their abusers, a false sense of unity is achieved, the victim maintains an inner knowledge of injustice the whole time. Yes, they said I was wrong, but deep down they know I didn't do anything, right? And so they've, they, they have that inner knowledge of injustice, but they usually suppress those thoughts. And then when those thoughts start boiling up again of, this is wrong, they start, have, they start blaming themselves for having unforgiving feelings and not being able to get over it, you see. So they've been abused, They've accepted the abuse, and then when the truth comes to the surface of their mind and says, this is wrong, they then abuse themselves. And they think themselves are bad for having these thoughts. And if they tell anybody about you know, these secrets of what they're thinking about, I just feel like something's wrong, they're then abused by the person they told it to. And they say, you're wrong, you just, you're just bitter. <laughs> and this goes on with domestic abuse, spousal abuse, church abuse. This is what happens. Child abuse. This is what happens. And then the abuser finds out that the abused has been talking to people. And then the abuser comes and abuses them again for talking. You're supposed to keep your mouth shut. That's what they say. And the cycle repeats until either one of two things happens. The re one, the, rebuser, the abuser repents, which is unlikely because that rarely happens. These cycles continue because no one ever confronts the abuser and no one stands up for the abused. And as long as he's getting away with it, why would he ever repent? Right? Nobody's standing up to Saul, except for Jonathan. Praise God for him. Uh, number two, the other thing that might happen is either the re abuser repents or number two, the victim flees or leaves or is driven out. A woman driven out of a home because her husband's an abusive Person, the child is driven out of the home because the parents are abusive. That's what happens. Either the parent repents, you know, and then there can be true unity in the home, but you don't tell the kid to apologize to the parent because you probably deserved it. That's sick. All right? Now, David dodged spear, Saul's spear twice, but listen, he can't keep dodging spears forever. If he stays, he will perish. And if he leaves, he might perish, but he might not. It's a lose-lose situation for David. It's kind of a lesser of two evils type of thing. You say, well, David, you just need to take it. <laughs> Why don't you take it? <laughs> You're not the one getting a spear thrown at your head. <laughs> well, just suffer yourself to be defrauded, David. Do you know what the word defrauded even means? Why is that verse always taken out of context? That has to do with taking a Christian to court. Has nothing to, it doesn't mean suffer yourself to be abused by everybody that comes and abuses you. That's a stupid preaching that goes around. And I, uh, it just drives me crazy because I see people suffering under that. I've had conversations in the last three weeks with different people that have been in abusive situations, and that's the kind of crap counsel they're given. So I apologize, there's kids in here. But that's the kind of counsel they're given. Just apologize to your abuser. No. Don't apologize to your abuser. Vengeance belongs to God. Give it to Him. Amen. Don't take it in your own hands and trust and be thankful for the fact that God will get that guy. <laughs> that can be a blessing. All right. Now, the average Christian counseling for David would have been, well, David, you know, just keep dodging those spears. Sooner or later, Saul will see that he's wrong. Or, you know, uh, if David, you just apologize, he'll quit throwing spears. How about this, David? Why don't you make a list of all the things that you like about Saul? And then go and tell Saul your list of all the things you appreciate him. And uh, maybe he'll stop throwing spears. <laughs> what? <laughs> the problem is not with David. You know what abusers do? They abuse. That's what they do. You don't change the abuser by apologizing and going back to him. The only way an abuser can change is if he realizes who he is and what he is and repents of his sin against the abused and against God. And David did nothing wrong. And when David ran from Saul to the priests of Nob and inquired of the Urim and the Thummim. Okay, you know that story? He goes to the priests of Nob and they get out the Urim and the Thummim, you know.
The thing means lights and perfection. You know, somebody, some people say the thing lights up when they inquire of the Lord. You know, and he's asking, you know, what does the Lord have to say about this situation? You know, and, and the thing starts lighting up. And, uh, you know, di- the, the Lord did not say, you need to get right with Saul. When he goes to inquire of God, you know what God does not tell David? Saul is the authority, and you need to submit to him. That's not what the Holy Spirit said. You know what God said? You know what God didn't say? He didn't say, David, you need to apologize to Saul because there's his side, your side, and the truth, and you're probably both wrong. Is that what God told him? No. No. Then why do so many Christians say that? (laughs) <laughs> it's like the problem was with Saul, but nobody wanted to say that because of fear. Fear that Saul would turn against them. Fear that Saul would start throwing spears at them. Fear that they would be banished too. That's why. So everybody keeps their mouth shut and they stick with Saul and David is forced to flee into the wilderness. Now consider the prophetic types here. Now that's the practical application of the lesson today. But uh, the prophetic, where we're going to get into now is some Bible study stuff. Uh, The prophetic types that we're dealing with here in the life of David, fleeing from Saul. He's fleeing from the face of Saul and Saul is demon possessed, right? Hold your finger there in 1 Samuel and look at Revelation chapter 12. All right, Saul we know is possessed by an evil spirit. And this time period of David's life where he's fleeing from Saul is a type of the great tribulation when the Jews are fleeing from the, uh, from the Antichrist. Now, in the future, after the rapture of the church, okay, the man of sin is going to be assassinated and will rise from the dead. We don't have time to go into all these scriptures, but I'm just going to kind of give you the highlights. When the Antichrist rises from the dead, just like Jesus did, he will be Satan incarnate, okay? That's when the man of sin becomes the son of perdition, all right? We will have three, there will be three and a half years for him to try and destroy, try to wipe out the Jewish race. You say, why does he want to wipe out the Jewish race? If the Antichrist can annihilate all the Jews, he can prevent the prophecy from being fulfilled because Jesus comes back to rescue the Jews. And if there's no Jews to rescue, Jesus can't return, So that's the goal, is to wipe out all the Jews. And then Jesus is basically stuck in heaven. He can't fulfill scripture type thing. Now Jesus told the Jews to flee into the wilderness when they see the man of sin stand in the holy place. And according to Revelation 12, they're going to be in the wilderness for three and a half years. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, the type of the nation of Israel, where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's three and a half years. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. The serpent is Satan. Okay. So for three and a half years, the Antichrist will be attacking and chasing Jews scattered all around the perimeter of Israel, just like Saul did to David. Now, you're probably familiar with the story of David and the things that happened uh, to Saul uh, and David during that time period in the wilderness. Okay, so I'm simply going to take. I'm simply going to mention some of these stories, and I'm going to take for granted that you're familiar with these stories. And if you're not, if I mention some names and some places and some events that you're just, you're not even sure of what I'm talking about, you can uh, go home and read 1 Samuel 21 through 31 today. Read those 10 chapters, and you'll find out all this information. 10 chapters. <laughs> now we know that uh, David's fl- <laughs> we know that David's flight into the wilderness is a type of the Jews being in the wilderness for three and a half years. Okay, so we got that type. I've always wondered how long was David in the wilderness for? Could he have fled from the face of Saul for three and a half years? <laughs> Maybe. The Bible doesn't specifically say. Okay, but it is at least possible. Okay, so I'm going to throw it out there that maybe it's a possibility. Maybe it is, maybe he didn't. Maybe it was longer than that, maybe it was shorter than that. But let's do some investigating and see if we can find out anything. Now, we know that David killed Goliath when he was around age 16, and he takes the throne of, in the kingdom of Judah. When Saul dies, he's 33 years old. Okay? 
So, so when Saul dies and, Ju and David takes the throne, David is 33. All right, did I get that right? Um, David becomes king at age 30. No, he's at age 30 because he reigns for 40 years. That's what I was, I was missing there. Okay, age 30. He reigns in Judah for seven and a half years, and he reigns over Israel and the entire... His whole reign is 40 years long. All right. Okay, so there's a period, basically, between the killing of Goliath and him coming on the scene with Saul to the death of Saul. There's 14 years there. You see that? 14 years. Time gap. Now, we know that he went and did a lot of fighting for Saul. He was captain over the armies of Israel. He did a lot of excursions fighting the Philistines. And then we have that story of the fleeing into the wilderness and all of that. All right, we know that uh, David gets married to Michael, Saul's daughter. And we know that during that time period, the rift between Saul and David grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that likely did take years for that thing to culminate in the way it did. Now, we don't know how long it was, but it seems unlikely that David would have been in the wilderness for over over a decade. I mean, you read the story, it, it doesn't seem likely that it was like 10 years that he was out there for. Okay, so I would say it's at least less than 10 years. All right, uh, three and a half years, I would say. Yeah, at least it seems maybe plausible. So let's see if three and a half years fits during this time period of running from Saul. All right, so let's look at the events that happen while David is in the wilderness. You have this thing where David flees, right? And the very first thing that happens after that is he goes to the priests of Nob, you remember, and he uh, gets Goliath's sword. And then, uh, let's see, I'm going to do Saul in blue. Get my markers here. Uh, Saul ends up killing the priests of Nob. Man, this marker. Remember, Saul goes there and he sees that... Uh, uh, Edomite, I think it was, the guy watching the flocks, his, uh, he, he squeals on him, and then Saul ends up killing all the priests. You say, why did Saul kill the priests? He killed the priests technically because that was their judgment for giving David bread. That was, a, that was not according to the law. They weren't supposed to do that. David was supposed to trust the Lord for his food, and he went to Nob and got some bread that he wasn't allowed to eat. And the priest said, yeah, then whatever. You're, we'll make an exception. And so they gave David the show bread, and the priests get wiped out. Um, that's another hidden detail in the text, but that's another story for another time. Now, what happens after that is uh, David has the situation where he saves Keilah Ki Ki from the Philistines. And then uh, he says, you know, he goes to the Urim and the Thummim out again and says, hey, Saul's coming. Saul is chasing David. Okay, and uh, Saul says, and David says, is the guys in Keilah going to deliver me up? And he says, yeah, they're going to deliver you up, so you better get out of here. So David flees. Saul ends up chasing David, and there's that situation where Saul's army is coming around the mountain, coming around the mountain when she comes. And David's uh, in a spot where he's completely surrounded, and he's about to be captured. Saul doesn't know that David's there, but they're about to come upon him. And at the last minute, Saul gets word that the Philistines are attacking again. And so Saul has to turn around and go and uh, fight the Philistines. Okay? You remember those stories? And Saul ends up going away. All right? Now, uh, let's see. It says in 1 Samuel 23, 14, it says, David abode in the wilderness and strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. All right. And so that is stated right here. Right after David flees, Saul is seeking David every single day until finally he's called off because he has to go fight Philistines. All right. Now, I'm going to call that whole thing uh, the pursuit of Saul number one. That, that right there is the pursuit of Saul number one. All right, now we don't have any indication as to how long all of that took or what that time period was. We really don't. Um, but uh, in chapter 24, okay, let's go to chapter 24. Actually, I'm not going to, it's in chapter 24. I'm not going to elaborate on this because it would just take too long. But in chapter 24, you have the pursuit of Saul number two. And in this particular story, you remember, this is when uh, Saul ends up going to the bathroom in the cave. And uh, David cuts Saul's skirt in the cave. Remember that story? And then Saul comes out and David says, hey, what are you chasing me for? And he goes and says, hey, I could have killed you. And he didn't, and so Saul ends up uh, 
uh, saying, you know what? You could have killed me, but you didn't. And Saul goes home. Okay. You remember that? All right. Now, again, we're not told how much time transpires. But after that story, we have the story of Nabal. Remember? The man of Belial, and he wouldn't feed David and his men, and that whole thing. And I'll talk about that more in a second. And uh, we're, again, we're not told how much time transpires in all of this. But then we have the uh, third pursuit of Saul giving in, given in the Scripture. And at that particular one, that's the one where uh, Saul, uh, David uh, steals Saul's spear. Remember, Saul and the army are asleep. A deep sleep from the Lord is upon the army, and David and... Uh, Abishai go down there and take Saul's spear and his bolster. Who knows what a bolster is? Anybody? Want to guess? It's um, something, a bolster is a pillow. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even know that until I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, a bolster is a pillow. He takes his pillow, his uh, my pillow, and I would have been upset. <laughs> but <laughs> so <laughs> surprised he didn't wake up. He must not have been a very good pillow. But uh, anyway, so he takes the spear and the bolster. And uh, once again, David, uh, Saul realizes that David could have killed him, but he, David didn't. And so Saul ends up going away again. Now, at this point in the story, David is real discouraged. And he's saying, and he basically says, you know what? Saul's going to be chasing me forever. This is never going to end. This is going to be this way forever. One of these days, Saul is going to kill me. And so David goes and dwells with the Philistines. Now, turn to 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27 and verse 7. All right, now this is the first time that we're told any length of time in this story. 1 Samuel 27, verse 7, it says, And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. All right? Now, after this story, we're not told really a whole lot of what happens during that time frame. But uh, David goes and makes a few little battles here and there. And during this one year and four months, at the end of this thing, there's a battle with the Philistines and Saul. And David is basically saying, OK, this is it. I'm with the Philistines now, so I'm going to go and attack Saul. And you remember what happens? The Philistines end up, the lords of the Philistines say, hey, we got to get rid of this guy. He's the guy that they used to sing about killing 10,000. What's going to happen is when we go into battle and approach Saul, he's going to suddenly turn. And, uh, you know, Saul's going to attack us in the front. David's going to attack us in the behind. David's going to side with Saul to, and kill us. So we need to get rid of David. And remember in Agag, or, or the king, or what was the king's Achish. name? Achish. Yeah, he says, uh, you know, you've been great. You've been like an angel of the Lord to me. Notice he didn't say you've been like an angel of Dagon to me. It's almost like there's something about that. King Achish, uh, he's learned some things about God from David. And he says, you know what? But the Lord of the Philistines don't like you, so you've got to get going. You know what you can learn from that? David was really upset by that. David was really mad. After all I've done... I've been perfect. I haven't done anything wrong. Once again, he's asking Achish, what have I done wrong? What is, my, what is everybody's problem? <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes God's people uh, can be rascals and treat you bad. But the world is no different. Right. And that's what you learn there. The Israelis, they forsook David. You know, they let him run and nobody came really looking for, da for, for David in the wilderness. Oh, well, I guess he's gone. He probably did do something wrong about Saul. We just don't know what it was. But the same thing is with the Philistines. The world does the same thing. Never forget that. All right. So this situation happens. And um, let's see. David, uh, Saul dies in the battle with the Philistines. Jonathan dies in this battle with the Philistines. David goes back and fights those people that burn Ziklag. And he gets all his family back. You know, you remember that story. David encourages himself in the Lord. Saul dies in battle. And then shortly thereafter, David is made king of Judah. All right. Now... We're not uh, told too many details about this, but I'm going to try to take prophecy and fill in some blanks. And it's funny how the Word of God works. Sometimes you can do that, and I'm not going to say this is doctrine, but this is some interesting things. We know from the Bible that history repeats itself. It goes in circles. And so usually if you don't have all the details of one story here, you can look at something that happens in the future and fill in the gaps because a lot of times the thing repeats itself. Okay, So we want to understand that we're going to kind of go into the realm of we can't prove this reading between the lines, but at the same time, there might be something here. And I want to show you it anyway. So just uh, 
you know, take it or leave it. So I want to lay this out on a spring fall timeline. And uh, we're not given the exact seasons, but I'm going to base my seasons off the types that we see in prophecy. And I'm going to work backwards. Okay, so I've got purple is going to be fall. And then we have green is spring, orange is summer, blue is winter. All right, nothing really happens in the winter in those old days. Everybody just kind of lays low. But when Saul dies, he dies where? In the Valley of Jezreel in the Megiddo area. Okay, he's a type of the Antichrist, right? He, right, we, we wouldn't argue that. Uh, he dies in Megiddo in Jezreel. And uh, he, let's see, there was something else about Saul that I wanted to point out. Uh, in Mount Gilboa is where he is. Okay, so Saul's a type of the Antichrist. He dies in the place where the Antichrist will die. The battle of Armageddon is at the hill of Megiddo in the valley of Jezreel. Saul dies in the exact same place, basically, where the Antichrist is going to die. So if I had to guess, now again, this is just a guess, so take it or leave it. I'm going to say that Saul died at the same time of year when the Antichrist will die. What, year, what time of year is it when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent? Is it summer, spring, fall, or winter? Anybody? Uh, technically, he dies in the fall. He, well, the, the man of sin dies in the spring when he gets assassinated. But when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, it's during the Feast of Tabernacles, which takes place in the fall, in the season of the fall, okay? The fall season. So the Antichrist is going to die in the fall season. So since Saul is a type of the Antichrist, I'm going to say that his death probably occurred in the fall. And David was made king over Judah in the fall because David as a type of Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ kills the Antichrist and becomes king over the nation of Israel and reigns during the millennium he becomes king in the fall okay so I think we're pretty safe saying that David being made king and Saul dying in the fall is probably pretty safe all right now David was in the Philistine land for one year and four months which would mean that the last time that he saw Saul you go back one year is fall Four months is roughly half a year, so it would be around springtime, the last time he saw Saul, and when, Saul, when he took Saul's spear, and that story. That would have happened around spring. All right? The next event in the story, if we go backwards, is this story of Nabal. Now, I'm going to put the story of Nabal, I don't know this for sure, but I'm going to put it in the fall. You say, why do you put it in the fall? Because Nabal, that whole story of Nabal, is another type of the death of the Antichrist. Nabal is a man of Belial. Okay? Nab uh, Belial is another word for the devil. Nabal is a man of the devil. And he ends up uh, giving David a hard time, and he dies. How long does it t The Bible says that he dies after a certain number of days. Who remembers how many days it was after he died? It was 10 days. 10 days, that 10 year end time tribulation type thing, after 10 days is when the Antichrist is going to die. He's going to show up. The man of sin is going to show up right at the end of the church age before the rapture, remember, because we're going to see the man of sin shall be revealed, right, at the end of the church. And then 10 years later, he dies at the hands of Jesus Christ, okay? So that's, that, that's similar to Nabal. Now look at 1 Samuel 25. There's also some other interesting types in that story of Nabal. David, after Nabal dies, David, a type of Christ, marries Nabal's widow, Abigail. And look at verse uh, 42. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her, like the five uh, wise virgins. And uh, she went in after the messenger of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. All right, so David ma marries two women. David's a type of Christ. He marries Abigail. The word Abigail, the name Abigail means my father is joy. And then he also ma uh, marries Ahinoam. And Ahinoam means my brother is delight or my brother is joy. So Abigail, my father is joy. Ahinoam, my brother is joy. That's interesting. Those are two very similar names, but they're different women. And he marries two of them. Okay, Israel's relationship to God as a nation primarily is that of a father and a son. Remember when Israel was in Egypt, uh, he said, you know, let my people go. And he says, if you don't let go of my son, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. If you don't let Israel go, I'm going to kill your firstborn. 
Remember, so you have that relationship. The church's relationship to Jesus is that of a brother and sister who are married. You say, that sounds weird. <laughs> that doesn't sound right at all. Well, here's the thing. Don't forget that the first man and woman who were ever married, Adam and Eve, are a type of Christ in the church, and they were brother and sister. And brothers and sisters could be married up until the time of basically uh, the law. All right? So that marriage is a type of Jesus Christ's relationship to the church. So David's marriage to Abigail after Nabal dies after 10 days is likened to the Antichrist dying at the end of the t end of the end times. Jesus then marries essentially the nation of Israel and he also is married to the church. All right? Abigail Ahinoam and all of that culminates after 10 days. Now the tribulation uh, the second advent, the millennium, all that typology uh, is unmistakable there, which is why I would again put the death of Nabal in the fall. Now, again, I'm not being real dogmatic about this. I'm just throwing it out there. I think that could fit. Okay, let's see. So going back some more, the pursuit of Saul, the second one where he's uh, in the cave in the skirt and all that stuff. I'm going to go ahead and stick that in the spring. Okay, just going back a little ways. You say, why do you do that? Well, Saul is obsessed with David. And so it would make sense if Saul's going to pick a time of year to go after David, okay? He's going to he's thinking about David in the winter, you know, and he can't do anything in the winter. As soon as he gets the opportunity, he's mounting an expedition. We're going after David as soon as that snow th melts. Spring. It seems like he's just he's eager. He's not like, "Hey, do you want to go one of his servants are like, "Hey, Saul, you want to go chase after David?" Uh, I don't know. I, Maybe, maybe in a few weeks, maybe, maybe around July, June, July, after the 4th of July, you know, I don't know. Do we got to go right? No, he wants to, he's like eager to kill David because David, as long as David's alive, Saul feels threatened. So he's after, he want to kill him. So I put it in the spring. All right, <clears throat> David, uh, then you go back a little bit farther, the pursuit of Saul. I would also put that in the spring when David first leaves and runs away from Saul. I would say that's the springtime, and he goes to the priests of Nob, and uh, Saul ends up coming after him and, and uh, kills all the people of Nob in the springtime. And then you give a little bit of time, you know, you're slowly... The, all of these things happened, it looks like, fairly consecutive when you read the story. So David at Keilah is probably around the summer months. Uh, Saul still chasing David, you get into the summer months, and then by the time Saul has to leave, you're probably getting close to the fall, and Saul has to leave. And then nothing happens in the winter. Now, that would, make, that would be consecutive consistent also because every single one of Saul's pursuits of David would be in the spring that would fit the two types of the Antichrist in this whole story die would die in the fall Nabal and uh, Saul okay and uh, let's see also David fleeing from the face of Saul would match if it was springtime that would match when the Jews have to flee from the Antichrist because when the when the man of sin stands in the holy place he stands in the holy place around the time of Passover you say, how do you know that? Because he has three and a half years, and he dies in the fall. So, real easy math. You go back three and a half years, and he's going to start in the spring. So, when Jesus says, flee in the mountains and pray that there's no, no, no uh, winter, right? It's because it's close to that springtime area, and you might have snow, you might not. All right, so, let's see. Uh, granted, I can't prove that. But uh, you can't disprove it either. <laughs> okay, so uh, there, there are types here, and the types match. So I think there's at least a good possibility uh, that this is accurate. Now, uh, what you have there is you would have what's interesting is you have okay, fall, one year, two year, three year, spring, half year. That would give you the three and a half years running in the wilderness. And I don't think that's too far-fetched. Like I said, I can't prove it. But it might be something to it. All right, and I wouldn't be surprised either, knowing how the Lord writes uh, history. <clears throat> okay, so uh, David flees, and Saul dies three and a half years later after David flees. That would match the tribulation period. All right, now there's one more detail that might verify my insanity here. Okay, now uh, if David began his reign in the fall. Now, what's interesting is the Bible doesn't usually tell you how many months a guy reigned for. 
usually they'll say, oh, Hezekiah, you know, he reigned 52 years. You know, and, and they'll say 52 years, this, that, this, that, years. It's not very often where the Bible will say somebody reigned a certain number of years and this many months. There's something significant to that. It does say that about David. It said that when he began his reign over Israel, he began, uh, he reigned for seven and a half years. Now, if he began his reign in the fall, that would mean that he uh, started his reign over Judah in the fall. Seven and a half years later, when he becomes king over Israel, what month would that be? Springtime, right? Yeah. It wouldn't be fall because that would be exactly seven years. So you go seven plus the six months, that puts you in the spring. All right, so he becomes king over Israel in the spring. Then, it's, then uh, 33 years later, he dies. And I assume, let's just say, that Solomon is made king in the springtime also. Because we're not told 33 years and six months. We're just told 33 years after he becomes king of Israel, Solomon is made king. So I'd put Solomon's kingship in the spring. And then four years later, look at 1 Kings chapter 6. We're almost done. 1 Kings chapter 6, four years after Solomon takes the throne, he starts building the temple. And we are given a detail here that might give us a clue as to validate what I've uh, spoken about this morning. 1 Kings 6 verse 1, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. All right, Ziph is after Abib. Abib is the time of the Passover. Ziph is the next month. So we're talking about uh, April, May. It's springtime. When four year, it says four years later, Solomon begins building the temple in the spring. Okay? So that is at least a clue that could indicate that if uh, he builds the temple in the spring, he go, you go back four years, he becomes king in the spring. You go back 33 years, is, David is made king over Israel in the spring. You go back seven and a half years, David is made king of Judah. That would put you in the fall. He's made king of Judah at the time when Saul dies, which would be the fall, okay, the fall season. And then you have what I gave you right here. So, maybe that's interesting to you, and maybe it's not, okay? <laughs> but uh, the point is, the Bible is an amazingly accurate book. It's an amazingly prophetic book. And there are all kinds of intricate things and details buried within every page of the Bible. It's all there. You just got to do some digging. And so uh, what we covered this morning are some more hidden details in the life of David. And I'll hit on some more next week that will have to do with intrigue and romance and suspense and drama. You know, and uh, the hidden details, the hidden details that I have for you next week are of soap opera proportions. So be sure to be here next week. I send an order of prayer. Father, I come before you, God, today and thank you for your word. Thank you for these things in the Bible. Uh, God, I just I find these things interesting. Um, I think that there might be something to it. Uh, maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. God, maybe we'll find out, find out in heaven that that's accurate or maybe we'll find out that it was completely wrong. I don't know. But Father, uh, all I know is there are types in your book. I know that this book is your book. And I know that nothing is by accident. And so, Father, I think what will happen is when we get to heaven, we're actually going to be blown away at how amazingly precise this Bible was in every single detail. And so, Father, I don't feel like I've gone too far out on a limb by suggesting that the stories, the things that happened in David's life and the few dates and times that you do record uh, match perfectly with prophecy. And so I pray that this would be a blessing to your people. I hope that they were fed this morning and uh, just uh, pray you'd bless us as we leave today. It helps us be a good witness for you this week in this crazy world that we live in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed.